Hey, web designer friend, I'm gonna walk you through how to structure your web design contract. This is key to protecting you from things like late client payments, scope creep, content collection issues, client boundaries and communication issues. This can all be avoided with a really solid web design contract. I'm gonna show you exactly what I use and how to structure your own, and you can take this and make it your own for your web design business. A couple of really important things I wanna note before we dive in. This is actually a lesson from my full web design business course. So there's a link below if you would like to learn more from me about helping you build and grow your web design business. Now, before you send a contract, you're likely going to be sending a proposal and a quote to a client. So if you don't know how to structure a high converting proposal, I've got a video below for you that I recommend checking out. That will be a great compliment to this. And if you ever want to automate your quote, contract and invoice all together with one click. There's an additional video below that shows you how I do that with a platform called 17 hats. So let's dive into web design contracts. All right, we're jumping straight into this lesson covering your contract. Yes, absolutely. One of the most important things we have in place here for your business to not only protect you as the designer, but your client too. So as we state here, right in the contract, this is for both parties involved. Now, what I'm going to do is we're not going to read every single word of this for time's sake, but I'm going to walk you through the main elements of the contract that I use and that I've refined over the years and that I have in place for you. So what you're seeing right here is the actual contract in a browser view that a client, in the case of me sending it through seven hats, will be able to sign off on. But below is a text file for you to take this content and make it your own. And for those of you who are using 17 hats or are going to use it, in the next lesson, I'm going to give you the import and export file where this will all just be at your, at your fingertips. It can be in, uh, imported right into your 17 hats. You will need to adjust this accordingly, though, with anything that you have that is special to your business in the way of services, uh, products, services, links, etc. So with that in mind, in short, the contract states that my company will be referred to as we, us, or our, and then them as the client will be referred to you, your, or the client. And here's the biggie. And this is what I've learned that helps clients understand a contract without it being a huge, <laughs> like, dictionary-style book that's 89 pages. I break it down into three phases. I love threes, and what I found that works best and what I've refined over the years is to say that phase one covers the start of the project, Phase two, with all the details below, cover the build and development aspect. And then phase three covers what to expect during the launch and ongoing support. And you can change this accordingly. And here's one thing that I added recently that's really important because I had some clients do this. And that is to let them know if they require any additional parameters or addendums that need to be added to this, then they are welcome to send that to you and you will update the contract with those parameters and those provisions. I had a couple clients in the medical field, add things to the contract, and we both had to sign off on those. So that's why I want to make sure you recommend to your clients that you are happy to do that as long as it fits in with the guidelines that you're comfortable with. So phase one, the project start. This will just cover the deliverables. Again, it's all below for you in more detail so you can read and comb through this and make it your own. But this covers pretty much everything. I mean, I would involve, I would advise you to consult with a lawyer at some point, uh, particularly as you get further and further along and as your business is more custom and the different services you provide. Uh, but this covers what I found pretty much everything as far as the foundation for all website projects. So deliverables and then payment. And then you can customize this again as far as your typical payment options, or you could just say this will be disclosed in the invoice. You can always say that as well. And actually, with that in mind, a lot of what you'll see here are going to link back to other pages, uh, which is the really handy thing about having a lot of information on pages without having to customize every single contract. When you're doing a lot of websites, you don't want to have to put like the entire scope and all the pages and exact details in every single contract. So payment, limited liability, just gives you some protection as the web designer as far as what you're liable for. Data protection, this could technically be inside that category, but I like to separate it just to say that not there's liability that you as a web designer are not responsible if it is the client in their business, but then the data protection when it comes to you like managing their customer information, uh, any sensitive information, let them know that you do your best to protect that in all of the tools and platforms you use. Hosting is a biggie. Uh, since we're talking about websites, I would. this is where we start to plug our maintenance plan and our care plan. 
Now, if you've gone through that course, you know that I say that you really want to sprinkle it in. And the cool thing about having it in places like your contract and other areas of the entire web design experience is by the time they get to signing on your care plan, they're already prepared for it. They already know about it and they're ready to go more than likely. So we mentioned hosting. I do recommend that you take on hosting yourself just to cut you out of the middleman between clients and then if they choose hosting. But if they choose a different hosting uh, company, then what I would do is just have an affiliate link ideally set up with them with your recommendations or this just lets you know, hey, we need the information. Expiration or cancellation, you can customize this, but uh, this will give you some details on how to protect yourself if a client wants to cancel. Accessibility. This is a big one nowadays in web design because there are a lot of legal implications with making sure websites are as accessible as possible. By legal implications, it's very rare that you're going to get sued. Uh, I guess this is probably a good time for me to issue a disclaimer that I am not a lawyer. I am not an attorney. This is just simply what I use and what I'm recommending everyone do now to protect both you and the client. But this just says that you will make every effort to ensure that the website you build for this client is accessible for everyone. And if they need advanced accessibility, they can click off to your, you guessed it, your hourly rate page. So just remember, a little while ago, in, in case you skipped that lesson, go back to it, the special and hidden pages. This is why we want to have this page. That way we can easily link to it from our contract and it's not you don't have to put that information here. And then when you up your hourly rate, you're like, oh shoot, now I got to go through all my contracts and redo that. So very handy to have those linked to those special and hidden pages. Uh, so yes, accessibility. Oh, important though, make a note that if the client is managing the site, adding content, et cetera, you are not respons uh, responsible for the accessibility components of what the client does. That's what that's saying. Privacy policies. Uh, if you are not yet partnered with Termageddon, I recommend it. You can go to joshhall.co slash Termageddon, which is linked right here, to sign up with an agent as an agency with them. That way you can have auto-updating privacy policies for every one of your websites. And I recommend making this an add-on in your website maintenance plan. So again, this is linked here, and then this will bounce them over to my maintenance plan page. Uh, but if they neglect your plan, just give them the options like, hey, if you ne neglect our plan or forego it, I recommend partnering with Termageddon for auto updating privacy policies. And you can always recommend that they consult with a lawyer to go through some of the stuff as well. Now, terms and conditions and uh, disclosures, this needs to be provided to you because you're not going to make up a business's terms and conditions. So you need to let them know for a terms page they need to send you all the conditions, especially if it's an online store with refund policy, support, et cetera. And then any disclosures, like if, if they have a contact form, they need to disclose that they're taking sensitive information in that contact form. This just states that you're doing everything in your power to make sure a client is GDPR compliant. And then one thing I found with some businesses, particularly if they have a product, is they may have a trademark or some sort of IP on something like an intellectual property patent. So I've, uh, I put this in more recently just to cover you. It's, it's actually not a coverage. It's more or less just a, a nicety uh, and it's something that separates you from everybody else by saying, hey, if you have a trademarked or pending trademark or proprietary information like an intellectual property product or service, let us know, disclose that, and we can arrange custom type of content collection or more advanced secure communications if need be, like some clients may not want to send something through email, which is not what I recommend anyway with content collection, but you can just work with them to try to make things as secure as possible. I actually had some clients have their own uh, assets that I had to go and log in and sign up for to be able to download. So uh, that's something that I just recommend having in there all within phase one, the start of the project. Now to phase two, the project build. Very important to state that you need a point of contact and what uh, to expect as far as training them. Project management, you can just talk about the tools that you use. You don't need to get wild with this, but just a basic highlight overview of what to expect, which will come into play once we onboard the client. But at least in the contract, it states, hey, we use Basecamp or Asana or whatever you're using. For file sharing, content collection, you can mention any tools that they should be prepared for. It's unlikely that a client's going to read every one of these, but it's just nice to know that when you sign a client and then you send them a drive link or a content snare link to send all their uh, stuff, they're, they can't be like, I don't want to use that because I don't, you know, I don't want to use that. It's like, well, it's in the contract that we use this and, and here's why. Of course, be nice about it, but it is good to just have this stuff written down. If for any reason a, a client gets a little 
odd about using the tools that you prefer and you need to be able to get a project done in time. Speaking of done in time, that brings us perfectly into Project Turnaround. You see how these kind of all lead into each other? Yeah, it's by design. It's also by uh, over a decade of uh, sending contracts and having to answer questions over and over. And I was like, dang it, I'm just going to freaking put it in the contract. So Project Turnaround, let clients know ideally how long projects typically go depending on the scope and size response time it's good to make sure that you address your response time and expectations that way a client doesn't email you on friday night and then they email you on monday morning and say hey how's the update that i send you on friday night it's like well it was the weekend so i'm not working this weekend so let them know that yes i have got that from clients and then also for your clients, you need to make sure that they are responsive and they need to agree to be responsive. Now, if somebody gets to you 73 hours after you email them, I don't think it's probably uh, worthwhile suing them for that, but it's just this just makes sure that they have some ownership and liability in this project too to get it done on time to avoid the timeline and delays. This is one of the most important aspects of your contract, the timeline and delays, because what do we all know as web designers, content collection and delays and projects that hang up because clients just disappeared and they're not sending you feedback. It's the worst. And it's what delays everything and can really throw your cash flow and your business off. So here's what I've learned to say that uh, you can read this again, word for word, but I basically say that we need to make sure we both agree to timelines and what is going to happen even when there are delays. So you can adjust this. If you do not want like, let's say you have an issue where a client is just not responding and it's been three months, then you could make this first part three months, which I actually may advise, actually. For right now, I'm doing the six months to a year because sometimes three months, it, it depends on where they are in the project. If a client is like 90% done with a project, but you're just waiting on final things, you may be at the three-month mark. But if you sign on and then it's been three months and you haven't heard a dang thing, that's where the cancellation and expiration type thing can come into play. But in any case, I say if after six months or the initial project start date, um, they haven't responded, blah, 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 then you can essentially redo the proposal and add late fees or add a uh, raised rate. Like a lot of times you'll start a project and then your rates may go up. And if your rates go up significantly, then after six months, if they have not got the content to you, then you ha you this gives you the right to do that only if they have not got back to you. That's the biggie. You can't raise somebody's rates if they're nice and timely during a project. And then after a year, this is where you can, this gives you the right by them signing off by saying that if they have not responded and it's been a year, and yes, this happened to me before. I'm sure it's happened to you, those of you who have been in the game for a while, even if it's like, even if they paid in full right here, after a year, if they haven't got you anything, you have the right to do a new project and say, you paid for this, but this was covered for a year. You haven't given us what we need. Now it's time for a, a new project and a new quote. And as long as they sign off on this, yeah, they're not going to like it, but you have to cover yourself. You do not want to get a payment in full and then have to do that project a year and a half later. And, and the reason I added this is because this happened to me with a client who literally paid in full. It was like a $3,000 site. And then they just plain disappeared. I didn't know if they died. I didn't know what the heck happened, but they were gone. And like a year and a half later, they came back and said, hey, Josh, I got the stuff. I'm ready to finish it up. And I was like, oh my gosh, I don't have anything in my contract that covers that. Now I do. And you do too. So you're welcome. And that leads us to phase three, the project launch and support. So launching the website, it's important to let them know that depending on what the server situation looks like and the hosting situation looks like they sign off on knowing that a project may be or a website may be down for a matter of 24 to 40 hours. Very rare, but depending on propagation time for servers, that can happen. I once literally had a client texting me minute by minute asking and telling me that his site was down. And I was like, dude, I told you we're, we're moving the site to a new host. You need to refresh. It's going to pop up shortly. And he was like, yep, still down. Yep, still down. I was like, I know, I freaking know. Uh, that's why I stopped working with auctioneers. Anywho, backups need to mention where the, the uh, site files are backed up upon launch and then ongoing as well. And if you have a security and maintenance plan or a care plan, that's where this specifies where you have backups depending on what tools you use. Website security, this is a biggie. Now you have to let clients know in the nicest way possible, you cannot guarantee 100% 
a secure website. And I've talked to a lot of security people over the years and they all agree just like accessibility and privacy, there is no such thing as a 100% secure website. Now, can you get 99.9% .9 there? Sure. Uh, and that's what you try to do with the security and maintenance plan. And then make sure you let them know if they do not do your maintenance plan, that's going to lead to what they are responsible for, which is next in the maintenance and update. So uh, you have your li uh, excuse me link to your plan. And then again, you notice a lot of these links are to the same pages because they all generally go to your maintenance plan or hourly rate options or upsells or add-ons or additional services. But here's the biggie. If a client neglects to use you for their care plan and they want to manage their site, they need to sign off on what they are responsible for. Now, in my maintenance plan course, I've showed you how to do this separately. So you can actually send this as a separate contract if you wanted to, although you don't want to make things too complex because just keep in mind, um, it's actually good to have this in here for the initial contract because all they're doing is saying like, even before they sign up, they're not saying they're neglecting your plan here. They're just signing that, yes, I've, I've read this and know what's ahead. But if at the end of the project, if they don't do your plan, then it's time to resend this. And you could make this something that they sign off on or just agree to via email. So if they forego the care plan, they are responsible for all these things. Um, hosting, point of contact, updating, restore points, backups, monitoring, and security. This, friends, I don't ever like using scare tactics to sell, but we're not scaring them. We're telling them like, this is what we're doing in our maintenance plan. So those of you who have been through the maintenance plan course, you know, these, this is literally like the list of deliverables that you're charging for. Um, so that's what they have to agree to. It, it gets you out of the liability for ongoing care and support. And if their site gets compromised, it's the best upsell to get them on your care plan moving forward. Uh, if you do have any warranty type thing in place, you can put details in here. I always said I'm happy to take care of any updates within 30 days of a website going live. Some clients have used that a little bit, but it wasn't a big deal. Uh, like in, in most cases, it was fine. It was nice for clients to know that I've got Josh in my corner for you know 30 days after the site goes live for any quick updates or like, oh shoot, I meant to add this. You're like, yeah, no problem. Um, and then you could, I mean, I wouldn't do, I, I would be leery about what a warranty is included versus what your maintenance plan includes. Um, and for example, like it, it kind of blurs together here, but you could really, a warranty is just saying when a site goes live, I'll be happy to do this and this and this for a period of maybe 30 days. I wouldn't go too much longer than that though, because you don't want to do free work for more than that. But there are going to be little things that pop up. I've found after about a month of a website going live. Uh, and then if, even when they're on your maintenance plan, it can kind of work hand in hand, which is pretty cool. I do recommend mentioning the credit that you can use the uh, the website project in your portfolio and in your social media newsletter, et cetera. You can customize this depending on what you're up to. And then testimonials. Make sure that uh, they know if they send a testimonial or if you request one that uh, unless they deem not, if they, if they need to hide their information, that's fine. But this just says you can use that testimonial for all your stuff as well. And then of course the client can sign here and then we're good to go. That's it guys. That is the overview of the contract. Three phases, plain English, very easy to understand, not overwhelming. I found contracts to be tricky because you don't want to scare and overwhelm your clients. Cause remember they haven't paid you yet. And what you'll see in the next lesson here, I'm going to show you the workflow is you want to make this like, okay, cool. Yep. Covers both of us. Yep. Looks good. And then they're ready to go. Looks built out, but not overwhelming, not a bunch of legal jargon. And then you're good to go. So again, this is an entire lesson from my full web design business course. There's a link below along with some details on how to get access to that. If you would like me to guide you through all the aspects of building and growing your web design business, then a couple other videos I'd recommend you check out from here. This video right here is walking you through how to build a high converting proposal for your web design projects. And right here, if you're interested in automating the quote, contract and invoice all together. This video right here will walk you through that as well. So head over there to one of those videos next and I'll see you there.